our own ability, cannot stand in the face of adversity, we could never find the strength to trust without faith. Because we don't have the capability to see above the trials that we meet, to keep our eyes focused on the King while counting the situation we are currently experiencing as joy. Faith works. This is the essence of James. We don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. Without faith, without works, we too quickly become that man in the mirror staring at his face, but then forgets the way he looks as soon as he turns away. But with faith, with works, we stay steadfast on this journey, progressively sanctified, knowing we'll be perfected once we reach the other side. Faith works. This is the cry of James, that faith apart from works can never be sustained, that in every day and in every way we should see this truth proclaimed because it's faith that makes us doers of the word, not just hearers. It's faith that keeps us humble, not proud. It's faith that directs our tongues to bless, not to curse. It's faith that causes us to show mercy, not judgment. It's faith that leads us to true religion, not its empty substitute. And it's faith that's causing us to preach the good news to every tribe, tongue, and nation with every breath that we breathe. And it will be faith that causes us to worship our God for all eternity. This is the message of James. Faith works. Looks pretty good, huh? You got Bibles, turn to the book of James, New Testament book towards the back after the book of Hebrews. Uh, good having Dave with us this morning, yeah? Give him a big, uh, and the band. I like it when Charles books guys that look like me. I mean, he's pretty much my twin, right? A little taller, younger, better looking. Okay, so... We just started the book of James, and I'm excited about this series for several reasons, but here's the deal. James is a book that's been called the Proverbs of the Old Testament. Proverbs in the Old Testament, obviously, is a book that has all these different truths. And so James, being the Proverbs of the New Testament, has so many topics that relate to our lives. In fact, if you stop and look at all the different topics, you've got it talking about money and wealth, right? James talks about trials and tribulations. James talks about wisdom and discernment. James talks about how our faith, how much it requires works in order to be energized. James has topics that relate in so many useful ways about relationships, about prayer, about the power of our tongues and our words to hurt or to help, even about how trusting God for our future determines how we walk our path in life. I love the book of James because that and so many more topics are covered. And so I said over the next four months, we're going to be looking at these five chapters, the things that James has for us to understand. And if anybody ever tells you, and you probably heard this, people sometimes will say, well, you know, the Bible. I mean, the Bible, it's, it's old. The, the Bible is confusing. And I've heard people say, well, the Bible, it just doesn't relate. It's not practical. It it doesn't really speak to my everyday life. I open it up, and I just don't know what it's supposed to do for me. And I'm just going to tell you honestly, if people say that, then they're really just not really understanding how powerful God's Word is and how much it relates and practical to every area of our life. And so I would just challenge a person who says that kind of thing, have you studied it? Have you really read it? Have you looked at it? Have you really allowed it to look into your life? Because as you're going to see over the next four months, I believe we're going to grow in our faith as we study this book. And so I said last week as we started the first verse of this book, I said in order to really understand the, the whole meaning and import of a book, it's helpful to understand the author. Who wrote this book? Why did he write it? Who did he write it to? And so last week we looked at the very first verse. If you got it, let's do it again today. James 1. Verse 1, we read, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, he says, greetings. And so I want to stop there again today. I said last week we were going to cover that one verse. 
Uh, we're going to cover that one verse again today. And then again, you understand why we're going to be four months in this book, okay? Now, I want to spend these two weeks because um, James is, is phenomenal in terms of who he was. And so by way of recap, because last week was Labor Day weekend, most of you weren't here, um, I want to give you a quick recap. Hope you had a good time camping. It was gorgeous. I didn't go. But uh, by way of recap, James, he is the half-brother of Jesus. Yes, Jesus had a family. Jesus had brothers and sisters. He was born miraculously through the power of the Holy Spirit, as Mary was, as the Bible says, um, found with child through the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was born. Joseph was not his earthly father. But after Jesus was born, then Joseph and Mary had normal relations and had several sons and several daughters. We looked at that last week. And so this is one of James, one of Jesus' half-brothers. And so the thing that we saw last week about his family was how much they struggled with who Jesus was and what he was claiming to be and do. You'll remember that they, in the beginning, they doubted Jesus. In fact, the Bible, remember, tells us that they thought he was out of his mind, his family did. He was teaching in a house one place, and they heard he was there, and they went to bring him home. It was a good old-fashioned intervention. This guy has lost it. He's nuts. They tell Jesus, hey, your mother and your brothers are outside. They've come to get you. And so they, in the beginning, they doubted. Wouldn't you say that's the epitome of doubt if someone thinks you're crazy? That's doubt, and if it doesn't, or if it's not, it'll do until it comes along. Would you agree? But the Bible also tells us not only did they doubt Jesus, they also dishonored Jesus. One of the times that he was traveling, and he was an itinerant preacher, traveling all, over, all around Jerusalem, Judea, even through Samaria. He traveled all over to towns, and he taught, he spoke, he encouraged, he healed, he fed, he did amazing things. And the Bible says one day he wanted to go back home to Nazareth, where he was from. And so he went to his own hometown with his guys, his disciples, and then he went to his own church, his synagogue. And he went in there and he began to teach in his own home synagogue in Nazareth. Like, that's a coming home, wouldn't you agree? The Bible says, unfortunately, they were offended at what he had to say, which caused Jesus to say to the crowds, he said, a prophet has no honor in his, where? Own hometown with his relatives and in his home, Jesus said. Now, this is his family, James included, in the beginning. They doubted, they dishonored, and it wasn't done. Even they disbelieved Jesus. The Bible tells us that his brother sat him down towards the end of his ministry and said, Hey, bro, if you are who you say you are, he had four brothers. If you are who you say you are, then why don't you go to Jerusalem? Like, like, quit with all these little small towns, go to the big city, and why don't you proclaim and declare in front of all the religious leaders who you really are? It was one of those, like, ch test challenges. Oh, yeah, go ahead, do it, if you're all that. And it's kind of the whole idea of we really don't think you are, and we're going to be proved right if you go and if you try and declare. Now, the Bible says, ultimately, Jesus did what they said. Not because they said, but he did. He went to Jerusalem. The Bible says that ultimately he was arrested, he was tried, and he was crucified. Now, let me just stop real quick and ask you a question. Do you think the brothers, James included, would have felt the least bit of guilt having to challenge their brother to go to Jerusalem, and he does, and then to have to watch him be arrested, to have to watch him be tried, and then crucified, including flogging? Do you think maybe they thought, ah, why did we challenge him to do this? Because the Bible doesn't say they hated their brother, but they definitely doubted Jesus. They definitely dishonored Jesus. They definitely thought Jesus was not who he said he was. And I'm relatively certain they would have had at least a modicum of doubt and angst and feeling of guilt for what they challenged him to do. And like any family member, folks, it would have been hard for them to watch their brother go through what he went through at the hands of the Romans. It would have been hard for any mom it would have been hard for any family member. And they watched Jesus. And you know, Mary, she saw her son being crucified. And that would have been heart-wrenching. They had a funeral. And folks, all of that existed right up until what we see the Bible says happened for James. He doubted his brother. He dishonored his brother. He disbelieved his brother right up until this happened. James saw the risen Lord. 
That changed everything for the half-brother of Jesus. That changed everything for James. Once he came face to face with his brother, because folks, remember, they watched his brother's dead, beaten, bloodied body put in that tomb. They watched the stone be rolled in front of the tomb, and then they walked home with tears in their eyes and a pit in their stomach because their brother had been put to death. He was gone. And yet, the Bible tells us three days later, the miraculous happened. Jesus, who was put to death and put in that tomb, Jesus rose from the grave. And then he appeared to people. The one who had nail-scarred hands and pierced by his side. In his side, the Bible says, he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul did that. Then he appeared to who? He appeared to James. That would be his half-brother. And then to all the apostles. And so this face-to-face -face that Jesus and James had, seeing his brother alive and standing in front of him, whatever kind of words were exchanged, and we're not told what they were, that would have been something that for James turned the light on. It would have flipped the switch, yes, in his faith. And we looked at all of that last week. He went from doubt to faith. That's what anybody has to do. Everybody has doubts in the beginning, yeah? Nobody's born a Christian. Nobody comes out of the womb, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus. No, you're a sinner in need of a Savior like everybody else. And everybody struggles with doubts about what is true and who is right and what religion and what way. And even when it comes to Jesus. But prayerfully and hopefully we go from that doubt to faith. And that's what we saw James and his family do. But not only that, and this is the second half. This is what I wanted you to hear this week before we get into the rest of this book. Because to understand all of this changes the whole complexity of this book. It changes the whole nuance of this book when you understand what James went through and what he struggled to do to come to faith. He came from doubt to faith. And then, folks, what you're going to see today is he went from faith to on fire. I love that. This man comes on fire for Jesus Christ. Now, he starts the book, he starts the verse by saying, James, a bondservant, right? And he says a bondservant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, my life as a bondservant, that's the word slave, doulos in the Greek, that means I give my life to serve my master. I give my life to serve my savior. We, we looked at that last week. That was his position. And then we looked at how he saw his half-brother, Jesus. He grew up with him. Maybe he shared a bunk bed with him. Definitely would have hung out with him. Definitely would have ate with him lived with him, saw his adolescence, saw him grow up. And the Bible says that now he saw Jesus as not Yeshua ben Joseph, Jesus, son of Joseph, but he saw him as the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord means kurios. So for James, Jesus was the ruler of all. And not only that, he said the Lord Jesus. Jesus is in Hebrew, Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. And so he saw Jesus as ruled and reigning over the earth. He saw him as the savior of the world. And then lastly, he calls him the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God that everybody was waiting for. That's a long way from doubt, dishonor, and disbelief. Wouldn't you agree? That's from date, from doubt to faith. And now, folks, let's look at what it looks like to go from faith to on fire. Because the first thing James does, seeing his brother alive again, is James joined the early church. You got to understand, historically, James joined the early church because the early followers of Jesus, they weren't called Christians. It was something called the way. And they really just saw it as a sect of Judaism initially, the way, these followers of Jesus. They were all Jews. There were no Gentiles. So they weren't called Christians. And though Christianity today numbers 2.4 billion on the earth, back then it started with about 120 people. In fact, if you got Bibles, hold your fingers there in James and go back to Acts chapter 1. Here's what we're told right after Jesus ascended. It says, now when he had spoken, Jesus, these things, while they watched, he, Jesus, was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they, the disciples, looked steadfastly toward heaven, 
as Jesus was ascending, went up, behold, it says, two men stood by them in white apparel. Read that, angels, right? Stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He'll come back the same way. And then it says, they, the disciples, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. By the way, when we go to Jerusalem, we go to the mount of Olivet. We go right to this very place where they believe Jesus ascended into heaven. It's awesome. And I know we've got about 15, 20 of you signed up to go to Jerusalem, to go to Israel. Next September, we're going to have an informational meeting. I'd love for more of you to join us because it's going to be awesome. And so I want to go on. It says they were there at the mount called Olivet. Verse 13, when they had entered, that would be they returned to Jerusalem. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. And here's the disciples, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued in one accord, which is one of the lamest jokes you'll ever heard. There's the first car in the Bible, an accord. Um, see, it's so lame you don't even want... Anyway, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and the Mary, the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and who? And with his brothers. So who was there in the upper room in the very beginning after Jesus ascended? What was the core group? It was Jesus his brothers, rather, and it was all the disciples and his mother. Now, I need to just quickly say something about this. It's really important to understand among the first followers of Jesus in the church were his mother and his brothers. And you got to stop back and consider what this means. Because prior to this, his family was devout Jew. They were devout in their faith. Everything about them, and to be a devout Jew meant that you worshiped at the temple. And all indications historically and even biblically tell us that Mary and Joseph, they followed the law. They went to the temple when it was required. They did the feasts and the tabernacles. They offered the right offerings. Everything about Mary and Joseph, and then after Joseph passes off the scene, everything continues with Jesus' family de being devout. They followed the rules. They did what was required in Judaism. And one of the rules of Judaism is found in what we call the Ten Commandments, right? The first commandment of the Ten says, there is only one God. And the second commandment says, you only worship that God. Or the consequence is, if you worship other gods, according to the law, the Ten Commandments is, you aren't a part of God's family. Now, that's pretty severe. And that's what this family, Mary and his brothers, that's what they would have been steeped in. They're not just going out looking for another religion. They're not just saying, hey, we're going to dabble in some other divinity. We're going to try on some other things. They were devout in their Jewish faith. They followed the law. They worshiped one God, Yahweh, right up until they saw the risen Lord. And now we see them worshiping their brother, Jesus Christ. Folks, that is huge. That is a massive deviation they would have, their status would have been changed with the rest of their family. Their status would have been changed in their community. Did you hear that Mary and the brothers of Jesus are no longer going to synagogue? They're no longer worshiping Yahweh alone. Now they're worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping their brother as God. That would have changed a whole lot of things, folks. That was a commitment. It was not cavalier. It was short, or is nothing short of awesome. Let me just ask you a question real quickly. Would any of you worship your brother as God? <laughs> of course not, right? If you have a brother. Why? Because you know who he is. You know what he's capable of. You probably were aroused by him. You probably watched him sin plenty, right? To go from, you know, growing up with your brother to being willing to worship your brother is a huge, huge step only taken by somebody who believes that this man was sinless, that this man was perfect, that this man committed no wrongs. That's exactly this transition. James joined the early church. And folks, they were all there. They were 
gathered together one another. But that's not all. I want you to see what happens next. James becomes a pastor in the early church. Not only does James worship with the other believers in the church, but this man that we read from his book, the book of James, he becomes a pastor in the early church. Now, it's one thing for James to say, well, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I want to be one of his followers. I want to be a part of this thing called the way, or later on, I want to be a Christian. And then go back to being a carpenter. I mean, that, that's, that's okay. That's a huge step. But yet, he didn't just go back to being a carpenter. James said, I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus was sinless. And I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I'm not going to go back to being a carpenter in my family's business. I want to now spend my life serving him and preaching about him. I want to become a pastor, and I want to lead people and point people to Jesus. That's hopefully what a pastor does. A pastor is meant to be a shepherd to guide people to the truth. A pastor is meant to be just someone who says, look, look at him. Look at him. And that's exactly what James starts by saying. James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do I know he became a pastor? Here's what happens early on. Christianity continues to grow. We know the story. And then uh, the, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls on the, the apostles in the upper room where they were. So arguably, the Holy Spirit fell on James as well. All of those in the upper room were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, one of them being Peter. And Peter goes out of the house. He goes down and he preaches a message. And the Bible says 3,000 people get saved that day. So the church went from 120 to 3,000 in one day. That would be cool. Don't you agree? We'd have to do like four services here. We could do it, but we'd have to do four or five services here. That would be awesome. But here's what happens after that. The Bible says as those church numbers were growing, Acts 2.42, and they continued, the disciples, the apostles, the church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Those are the four things they did. The truth, teaching, fellowship, they ate together, and they prayed together. But remember, the early church was made up primarily of Jews. Even when it went from 120 to 3,000, it was still just Jews, Jewish Christians, people who had been in the Jewish faith and then realized the Messiah they were looking for, that Messiah is Jesus. And it was still just a, a Jewish thing at this point until a man named Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting the church, if you know your history, he was going around, he was a prominent Pharisee, and he was persecuting the church, the Bible says. He's going up to Damascus to round up some more Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. The Bible says that he has a Damascus Road experience. He's blinded and he becomes a Christian. Jesus shows him. He's blinded by the light. Read that, Jesus. Jesus shows him what he's going to do for him. And Paul then, along with a guy named Barnabas, they go off on these missionary journeys, four of them, and they start over all of the Roman Empire preaching Jesus. And guess what happens? The church is no longer just about Jews. The church is now including these people called Gentiles. You know what a Gentile is? A non-Jew. And what that means is all of the rest of us who didn't grow up as Jews. And so now the gospel, the truth of Jesus, is extended to the whole world, not just one people group. But some guys were having a question about, well, hold on. To be a Jew is kind of finite, kind of narrow. There's some th things you have to do. No ham sandwiches, okay? Can't have any pork ribs, if you like that kind of thing. Bacon's out, so I'd be out. Um, bacon's out, no pork. And guys, there's this little thing you've got to do, <laughs> maybe not so little, um, if it's going to happen to you. Um, you have to be circumcised in order to be one of us. Um, if you don't know what that is, yeah, everyone knows what that is, never mind. So here's the deal. There was a question, well, these people are becoming Christians, and some of the Pharisees, some of the, the people who were still uh, Jewish but still believed in Jesus, they were saying, we need to make sure these Gentiles do the right thing. I think they should not eat pork, and we think they should be circumcised, and then they can, can become a Christian. 
and guys were saying, well, I don't think that. In fact, let's read it together. If you've got Bibles, I want you to see this. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. I'm going to read this. This is the story, how it went down. This is all helpful for you to understand before we get into the book. So the question, what do we do with these new Gentile Christians? Do they need to get circumcised? If I was one of them, I would say, can we check on that? Is there a way we could make uh, no pork sandwiches, no ham sandwiches? Can we check on that? I kind of like my, um, can we make sure? And so that's what they did. They're going to have a meeting. There's guys, they're coming, they're saying, let's, let's, let's talk about this. Let's see what happens with these Gentiles. And so Acts 15, excuse me, Acts 15 verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. Here's these guys. Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be a Christian. You cannot be saved. And therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small disagreement, dissension, and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem. This is the main church. This is the hub. This is the home church, the big one. Go up there to the apostles and the elders, and let's talk about this question. What should happen for the Jews or the Gentiles? So it says, being sent on their way by the church, Paul and Barnabas, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversation, or conversion rather, of brethren of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the believers. And when they had come to Jerusalem, it says they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported, Paul and Barnabas did, all the things that God had done with them. But it says some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, that would be, the, they, they're Christians, they believed in Jesus, they rose up saying, it's necessary to circumcise all these Gentiles and to keep commands that, that, that Moses gave, right? And to command them to keep the law of Moses. So it says the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And this is the big meeting in Jerusalem. And not everybody's invited to this meeting, folks. This is not a congregational meeting that anybody can come to. This is the, the elders of the church. These are the apostles. These are the folks that, you know, only a few are going to speak at this. These are the people who have the spiritual authority that Jesus gave. Peter's there. And Peter arguably was the most prominent in the early church, right? Jesus told him, you're going to lead my disciples. And so Peter's there. And all the other apostles are there. James, as you're going to see, is there. And here's what happens with this meeting. When there had been much dispute, verse 7, Peter rose up and he said to them, Men and brothers, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart acknowledged them, the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, the Jews. And he made no distinction between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Read that just as he did ours. Now, therefore, Peter says, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, adding this no pork and this circumcision, a yoke, on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But, Peter says, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. How? Read that by faith. Okay? Then it says, all the multitude kept silent and listened as Paul and Barnabas declared all the miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. They, they gave a report, right? If you're a missionary and you come home to your home church, <laughs> you're like, well, here's what happened. Here we went to this city and this happened and God did this. And I mean, it was an amazing thing that they were sharing because if you know your missionary journeys, amazing stuff happened. And they're reporting this to the elders of the Jerusalem church. And it says, verse 13, after they had become silent, James, the brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus, answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Now, I want you to picture that. This is one of the most important discussions in the early church, one of the most important decisions. What are we going to do with these non-Jews? What do they need to do to be saved? This is huge. And James, after Peter shares and Paul and Barnabas share, James stands up and he says, men and brethren, listen to me. Read that Paul, the apostle, listen to me. Peter, listen to me. Uh, all the rest of the apostles, listen to what I have to say. And here's what he says. He says, Simon has declared how God at the first 
visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Now he quotes the book of Amos, an Old Testament book. After this, I will return and re will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that, hear this, the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Even in the Old Testament, it was prophesied the Gentiles would come to know the Lord. Amen? And, and James, filled with the Holy Spirit, James, with all the authority, James stands up and he brings clarity to one of the most controversial issues that ever beset the early church. The Holy Spirit anointed James, the half-brother of Jesus, to speak something that changed the course of the church for the rest of history. Amen? That changed the course of history for the rest of us called Gentiles. And James finishes by saying, known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, James continues, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles, speaking now to the whole church. I, we shouldn't trouble them who are turning to God, but that we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols. That's cool. From sexual immorality. That's necessary. From things strangled and from blood. That's weird, but it's okay. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Folks, do you see the spiritual authority of this pastor named James? Do you see the Holy Spirit resting on him, giving him the words of truth, and him having that gumption authority to stand up and bring clarity and cut through it and say, here's what we're going to do. Now, I'm not going to read it, but Acts 15 goes on to say everybody agreed. Everybody's like, well said, man. That's what we're going to do. They all submitted to James. They listened to what it is the Holy Spirit said through him. And folks, I bring all of this up that James became a part of the early church. And I bring this up that James became a pastor in the early church, that they listened to James because just as James says, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, over the next four months, our challenge is to listen to God through the man that he used to write this book called James. Our challenge is to submit ourselves to all of these scriptures and all of these chapters, five of them, to see what God would, through the power of the Holy Spirit, speak to your life and mine about the things I said at the beginning, about the power of the tongue, about wisdom and wealth about trials and tribulations, about relationships, about trusting God, all of the topics that this book includes, guess what? You and I need to walk in this truth. Amen? And so just as he said then, listen to me, he's saying it today. Listen to the words of truth that I have to say. And folks, we're going to be changed as we do that. And the last thing I want you to see about this man, before we go to James chapter 1, verse 2, which we're going to do, and we're going to get to the end of the book today. We'll get to verse 2 next week. I want you to know how James ended his life. Because the Bible tells us nothing about how his life ends, but history does, historians do. Eusebius, one of the early church historians, writes about James, and so does Josephus, who was conscripted by the Romans to write a Jewish history, if you know Josephus. Because James gave his life for his Lord. He was one of the disciples, one of the apostles, one of the followers. Like they all did, James gives his life for his Lord. The Bible tells us nothing about that, as I said, but Josephus tells us that in AD 62, about 30 years after his half-brother was crucified, after he led the church in Jerusalem for about 30 years, 31 years, the Bible tells us nothing, I keep saying that, Josephus tells us that he's taken to the top of the temple by the Jewish religious leaders, and he is thrown off the top of the temple. Amazingly, he doesn't die. He's a tough old dude, right? I mean, this guy was tough. The temple, if you've been there, it's not there. But if you see pictures, it's big, it's tall. And so he was taken to the top of that temple, and he was thrown off. He doesn't die, so they grab him, they beat him, and then they stone him to death. And you know what? Mary, the mother of Jesus, 
31 years earlier would have saw Jesus, the older brother, die. And now she would have been made aware and maybe even saw her next in line, James, give his life for Jesus Christ. He died for his Lord. And you know what happens? The Bible tells us, Eusebius does, and also other church historians, people believe, that his next in line brother, a guy named Simon, his brother steps up and he says, I'll take his place. And Simon, another one of Jesus' half-brothers, he becomes the religious leader primarily in the church of Jerusalem. And let me ask you a question. If your brother died on the job, would you be there next in line to say, I'll take his place? What what did he do? Uh, I'm there. Because Jesus dies, and James says, I'll preach. James dies, and Simon says, I'll take his place. You know why? Because they had seen their brother rise from the grave. He had defeated death. He conquered sin and death. And so now for them, it didn't matter. Kill us. It's okay. We know where we're going, and we're going to see our brother again. Amen? Now, I don't know about you, but I would say that's a family sold out for the truth. That's a family sold out for Jesus Christ, who in the beginning, they doubted, who in the beginning, they dishonored, who in the beginning, they disbelieved, they questioned, they had all of those things. And folks, as I share about this amazing family, do you know that one of his other half-brothers is named Judas? He didn't go by that name for obvious reasons. He went by the name of Jude. And if you got Bibles, turn to the very back. You don't have to literally, but turn to the very back. And there's a book called Jude because two of Jesus' brothers wrote books of the Bible. Two of Jesus' brothers served in the new church. The whole family was given over to this man. Now, I don't know about you, but when I sit down to read James chapter 1, verse 1, and all of the rest to the end of verse or chapter 5, to me, that changes everything about what I read in this book. How about you? That gives me context and clarity and understanding that I say, I want to hear what this guy has to say. This guy was sold out for Jesus Christ. His brother was sold out. You can read Jude as well, and it says Jude, the half-brother, or the brother of James, and read that, the half-brother of Jesus. This family loved the Lord. And if you're here, and you're not a believer, if you're watching online, and you're not a believer, I have to ask you this question. How in the world do you account for this kind of behavior? How in the world do you account for this kind of family? There's no fame in what they did. There's no fortune in what they did. There's no glory in what James and Jude and the rest of the brothers did for their half-brother Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet they gave their lives. They stepped up in place. I'll take his place. You're going to throw me off the temple too? That's okay. I believe in Jesus. You see, I don't want you just to admire this family. I want you to become a part of this family. I don't want you just to look at this family and say, wow, they were committed to Jesus I want you to come to a place, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, where you commit your life to Jesus Christ, where you give your life and want to serve him. You don't have to become a pastor. You don't have to become an evangelist. You don't have to become any of those things. You can continue to live your life the way that Jesus wants you to. But folks, to be sold out for Jesus Christ changes everything. Amen? And that's what we read about here, and that's what we see. His family, they struggled. They knew him, they knew a little bit about him, they liked him, but being concerned about what he was saying, doubted him, dishonored him, disbelieved him, and they changed to (laughs) full-hearted, full-throated commitment to Jesus as God and Savior. And the invitation is still being offered today. Don't just admire James and Jude and the family of Jesus. Join his family by turning from sin and trusting him. Amen.